Good afternoon and welcome back to LI Studios. I'm Kyle Bechet, Communications Manager here at the Leadership Institute. Today is our free live webinar um, and our topic for today is Stories of Success, Lessons in Direct Mail Fundraising. Our guest for today is Richard Vigory, founder and president of, the, of American Target Advertising. Richard has been on the forefront of conservative direct mail fundraising for many decades. So we're in for, uh, for an awesome webinar today with a lot of great information and great stories. But before we get into that, as always, I want to encourage you uh, to send in your questions using live at leadershipinstitute.org or by tweeting at us using the hashtag LIWebinar. With that, Richard, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, Kyle. I always enjoy coming back to Leadership Institute and talking about marketing. Yeah, well, we're always glad to have you here, here whether it be in the studios or downstairs on the third floor, giving us all of your knowledge. So what is the deal with this direct mail fundraising? <laughs> what, is the, what are the, the high points, the low points, and, and everything in between? Well, going back to kind of the beginning for, for me, Kyle, a uh, brief uh, review here. I'm 81 years old. I uh, literally go 12, 14 hours a day, five and a half days a week. Love every minute of it. Our company that you made reference to, American Target Advertising, have 75 employees, and we're hiring, by the way. <laughs> uh, we'll mail between now and uh, Election Day uh, next year uh, about 150 million postal letters, uh, many hundreds of millions of, of emails. Uh, so. Uh, uh, direct mail is alive and well, uh, and we can talk about that a little bit uh, later. But uh, I'd like to make the point, without direct mail, there'd be no modern-day conservative movement. When I, uh, in 1961, went to New York to become executive secretary of Young Americans for Freedom, I ran the organization, did everything uh, that they needed, the, the president or the leader of the organization would be expected to do. But after about a year and a half, I said, hey, I'd really like to be relieved of all duties except direct mail. I really like this direct mail stuff. <laughs> and I did that for a year and a half, and now it's December of 1964. We conservatives had their head handed to them in the uh, Goldwater debacle there. Uh, and I said, I'm, uh, I know everything there ever is to know about direct mail. I want to start my own company. Of course, I knew nothing, <laughs> but, but, but I thought I did. Uh, and uh, so in January of 1965, I start the Vigory Company, which uh, was the, the world's first uh, direct marketing, uh, ideological, political marketing company. No one had ever raised funds or marketed uh, causes or candidates or issues politically, ideologically through the mail before that. And so uh, I did that in 1965. And for about 15 years, basically, I had no competitors out there. And, uh, and caught a lot of criticism, by the way, from the establishment. You know, what's this uh, raising money from direct mail, the bypassing the leadership of the Republican Party? Caught a lot of criticism on national television, radio, New York Times, NBC, etc. All the criticism stopped within a few hours. And that was election night. November 1980, <laughs> when collectively you could hear the political community say, aha, that's what Vigory and friends have been up to. And uh, so the left ran out there real quick, like, to try to catch up with us, uh, the uh, conservatives, because the Republicans, you know, ran away with the presidency. Re uh, Reagan won in a landslide. We got the Senate uh, and big gains in the House and the governor's legislative races. And but I told my friends, don't worry. It's taken me 20 years to do this, and it'll take them 20 or more years because I'm smarter than they are. <laughs> well, not so. Within, I think, three, four years, the left had caught up with the conservatives uh, from the standpoint of direct marketing, direct mail, and to this day, in my opinion, the left does a far better job than uh, conservatives uh, do uh, in, uh, in direct mail. And one last comment is that uh, throughout the 1960s, 1970s, most of the 1980s, uh, the left had a monopoly on the microphones of, of the country. If this were the country's microphones here, uh, our message went up against this blockage and just kind of fell to the ground like the tree that fell in the forest. No one heard about our candidates, our causes, our issues until direct mail came along. And that was how conservatives, and the only way conservatives could really communicate with each other in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. I can make a strong case that Ronald Reagan would not have been elected president, wouldn't have been nominated, and then for, therefore couldn't have been elected president without direct mail. In 1976, when he's running for president, 1980, 
uh, he's got 250,000 small donors, 25, 50, 100 dollar donors. His competitors, uh, George Bush, John Conley, Howard Baker, Bob Doe, are getting the thousand dollar contributions. Mm -hmm. there'd, so there'd be no modern day conservative movement without uh, direct mail. Now since then, uh, we've added uh, uh, to the new and alternative media of direct mail. Uh, talk radio, cable television, the internet, and it leveled the playing field for conservatives. And without this new and alternative media, conservatives wouldn't be competitive. Great. Um, so you're saying, so direct mail was successful because it was able to um, give conservatives a voice that they didn't already have. That's the gist of what, uh, of the success that you saw in the 60s mm -hmm. and the 70s. What are, you know, so, Take us through direct mail. What are what what uh, it gives us that success? But what are the what are the other things that you've learned throughout your years of experience that our viewers can take away? Well, you use the word learn. Mm -hmm. uh, the as very very important. If, man, if I could only communicate maybe one message uh, today, it would uh, be that to uh, the uh, people uh, listening to us now, Kyle, and that is read, 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 study, 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 marketing. Uh, when I went to, uh, to New York in 1961, uh, I didn't know anything about direct mail uh, fundraising. Of course, hardly anybody else did in terms of political direct mail. Nobody knew anything about it. Uh, so I started reading David Ogilvy and all the other giants out there, took seminar courses and read every book that I could. And, uh, and by the way, then and now, I feel that I learned about 90% of what I learned from uh, the commercial world. I learned very little, quite frankly, from the nonprofit world. Uh, some, but, but not a lot, because quite frankly, there's not a lot of professionalism uh, in nonprofit marketing. So that the, particularly the young people listening to us now, if you spend the next four or five years in a major study of marketing, as I did back in the early 60s, within four or five years, you can be the top 5% of your profession because there is so little professionalism mm -hmm. out there. I've said many times that I wouldn't dream of flying in an airplane with a pilot who had the skills of the average person in nonprofit marketing. And that's true, I think, of Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, charitable health and welfare. There's just not a lot of uh, professionalism out there. Uh, and by the way, talking about going back to 1961, I jokingly refer to myself sometimes as 003, <laughs> which, which means I've been active at the national level longer than every living conservative. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 002 is uh, Dr. Lee Edwards at the Heritage Foundation. And uh, 001, maybe we'll uh, ask our uh, listeners if they want to, <laughs> you know, email and who is 001 at the end of the broadcast. We'll, 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 uh, see, we'll, we'll see if we get any good okay, responses good. on that. Um, so this, this conversation, uh, obviously there are things that people can do wrong with direct mail marketing. What are the, have you run into any problems or mistakes that people make when doing direct mail that they should be watching out for? Well, as I said earlier, you know, there's so little professionalism, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, study the, the giants out there. And, and uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, when I started doing direct mail uh, fundraising back in the 60s, uh, I studied the commercial arena, as I said, and quite frankly, I didn't find it that difficult because giants had come before me. Uh, not so with the internet. Giants haven't come before us. We're still trying to figure out. Uh, uh, we're all playing Lewis and Clark, quite frankly, going where no one's gone before uh, in the internet. We'll figure it out. It might be this afternoon, might be five years from now, but we haven't figured it out. And so, right, by the way, uh, so many people think that direct mail is a dinosaur, it's over with, its best days have come and gone. Not so. Uh, those nonprofits that are doing cutting edge work uh, are getting about 10%, maybe 15% max of their income from the internet. Uh, they're getting still 85, 90% from direct mail. And the average nonprofit, particularly every non conservative organization that I'm familiar with, getting three, four, maybe 5%. That's going to change, but it'll take. 12, 15, or more years for it to change. But right now, direct mail is still the workhorse for, uh, for, for fundraising through, through uh, uh, new and alternative media. Okay. Um, when we're talking about direct mail marketing, obviously you need to have um, lists and things to send people, uh, uh, a list of people to send your information to. 
what is the, what, how do you suggest to people going about building the right lists? Because I know from personal experience with email marketing that the right list doesn't always guarantee you success, but you know, the, the wrong list guarantees your failure. Well, well said, Kyle, well said. Uh, when, uh, uh, just you want to talk about stories here, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a quick story along that line. Uh, when I uh, started my company, uh, and I went with no one I'd gone before with political direct mail back in uh, 1965. You know, I'm young, I've I'm, I'm got a, a, a new wife relatively, to, you know, we've only been married a few years, had two babies, and uh, I thought I knew everything. Of course, I, I knew very little, but the one thing that I knew was a problem, uh, and that was list. Because uh, now the uh, Marketing, direct marketing, is a very mature business. It was much less so 50 years ago. And there were hardly any conservative mailing lists, okay? So uh, I discovered in 1964 that if you were running for President of the United States, you had to file with the clerk of the House of Representatives in Washington all your $50 plus donors. So I went down to the clerk's office and sure enough, there was a big stack of Barry Goldwater donors, you know, 50, 100, 1000 dollars donors. So I started copying on a legal pad like this, came back the next day, wrote some more. So after a day and a half or two days, I said, hey, I'm not making a lot of progress. Uh, uh, so I hired about five or six women and got 12,500 of Goldwater's donors, uh, federal, national donors. And uh, that gave me the, uh, the courage, the uh, confidence to go out and, uh, and quit a good paying job and, and start my own, own business. Then I said, well, that must, uh, if it's true at the national level, it must be true at the state level. So I flew out to uh, Sacramento and Austin, Texas and here and there and did the same. So by the end of that year, 1965, I had about 100,000 donors to conservative Republican causes. And it didn't uh, take very long before a few years, and I had a million donors. And now, today, we've got 10 million uh, conservative Republican uh, donors. And so the key, you know, you start with a lot of things, but, you know, if you don't have that right mailing list, the, the, the world's best direct mail package sent to mm -hmm. the wrong list is, is not going to be successful. You, me you mentioned an in you saw that you had an increase of donors. Does that come from pure direct mail fundraising? Because that seems like a lot, a huge increase from just direct uh, talking to them through direct mail alone. Or did that come with personalized meetings as well? Well, building the mailing list? You yeah, know? well, I mean, talking, yeah, the, the growth and size. Some of those donors, I imagine, have been on there f for quite a long time. Did you, uh, do you ever uh, work with those donors in person, ever give no. in-person meetings? No, just no. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I want to talk about here is, uh, is my vigorous four horsemen. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I've carved out a niche. In fact, I got into uh, uh, direct mail fundraising because I didn't like asking people for money. When I went to New York in 1961, uh, Young Americans Freedom had just been founded months earlier on Bill Buckley's family estate in Sharon, Connecticut. And uh, I wasn't there, for, unfortunately, but uh, I was running the organization now. And uh, they had a big name, but they didn't have, uh, they had a handful of donors and a, and a big debt. And so uh, I was uh, the, uh, my boss was really uh, running an advertising agency as, as, uh, for uh, uh, different causes out there, and he was very close to Bill Buckley, and he had the YAF account, and he uh, knew lots of wealthy people, so he gave me the names of three wealthy people to call and ask for contributions. Charles Edison, the youngest son of the inventor, uh, J. Howard Pugh of Sun Oil Company, and uh, you're having a Rick Perry moment here. <laughs> uh, uh, J, uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, captain mm -hmm. of uh, Eastern Airlines, uh, former uh, head of founder of Eastern Airlines, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, famous World War I uh, hero. So anyway, they were all very generous, gave me contributions, but I realized I didn't like uh, asking people for contributions. So anyway, I uh, got a secretary, wrote some letters that seemed to work, got what uh, most of your listeners never heard, maybe the word mimeograph machine. <laughs> <laughs> Had a big role, you just crank it and turn out letters. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I did that and it seemed to work. And uh, so uh, uh, we also had a business model, uh, which is uh, very interesting, I think, and it's uh, uh, served us in good stead for 50 years. 
When I started uh, in 1965, I would had a few clients, and I would go to these clients and uh, do mailings, and maybe we'd mail 5,000 letters, and they just worked really good. And I'd, I'd say, okay, now the test of 5,000 showed it, uh, it's successful. Let's mail 50,000. Then in, uh, when that results come back, we'll go 100,000, 200,000. And they say, no, 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 let's mail another 5,000. I said, no, no, the barbarians are right there. I can see them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We've only got a short period of time to save America here. And they just, you know, wouldn't do it. Uh, I've discovered uh, over many years that God in his infinite wisdom seldom saw fit to put in a nonprofit in body, an entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit, which is a risk taker. And so I said, okay, I want to save the world by sundown. How do I do it? Okay. Uh, and so I came up with the idea of I would take the risk. Okay. Uh, I want to mail those 50,000 after the 5,000 test mm -hmm. did well. And so uh, I'll come up with the money and the finance. And uh, by the way, uh, I want to copy the names and addresses of the people who respond to, to the mailing. Uh, and we did that for lots of organizations. And that was a major, major uh, reason why we were able to build the conservative movement quickly in the uh, in the late 60s and then through uh, through the 1970s. So we could, uh, through uh, getting uh, you know donors, uh, public records uh, to Republican candidates, we also uh, mailed uh, millions, of ma very quickly we were mailing 50, 75 million letters a, uh, a year. So the people who were responding to those mailings went into this major uh, donor base. And so when a candidate, like let's say Jesse Helms, uh, in 1972, uh, was elected to the Senate for the first time, and he had a debt. So uh, Tom Ellis, his uh, uh, campaign manager and, and friend, called me and asked if I could help with that $90,000 debt. I said, yeah, I think we can make two mailings, pay off the debt, and you'll have a little money left over. And he didn't know quite how that worked, but I went down to the Senate and explained it to uh, Senator Helms, and we did it. It was like clockwork. We did two mailings of 35, 40,000 each <laughs> because I could go to donors who had given to a, another conservative organization the previous month, the previous year, et cetera. So having a donor base of conservative donors uh, it was al allowed us to build, help build the conservative movement quickly in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, as I said earlier, there'd be no conservative movement worthy of the name without uh, direct mail. Hmm. You, said something, you said something in that uh, quite a few times that was very striking to me. You didn't like asking people for money. Uh, that seems like a very, very hard thing to do, especially even in direct mail fundraising. Is how, did, uh, how do people overcome that? You obviously mentioned that you yeah. didn't really overcome it, and so you went to direct mail fundraising. So what, uh, is there a way to ask people for money in direct mail fundraising that's different from in person? Well, you know, uh, I'm a big believer in, in not trying to uh, uh, work on your, your weaknesses. Uh, life is too short for that. Identify your strengths and put almost all your energy and resources in, into that. And so, uh, you know, I admire and I have many friends out there, uh, including John Von Cannon at the Heritage Foundation and many others who are masters at one-on-one uh, -on -one fundraising. That's just not my, uh, my strength. And, uh, so I uh, put my resources, uh, energy, into becoming the best uh, direct marketer that, that I could. And I, uh, there are people listening to us who enjoy, who are good at one-on-one -on -one fundraising, and there are lots of people who can help teach you. And by the way, I was fortunate to have about three mentors in life uh, as, who are really giants in terms of marketing, fundraising, and I encourage everybody who really wants a, a major career in, in marketing to get a, uh, a mentor, a guru, if you would. And uh, it makes all the difference in, in the world there. Absolutely. Um, I think this is a good time to go. We have a bunch of questions coming in from our audience today, which is great. Um, uh, one of our viewers named Susan wants to know, uh, what is what would be the cost of running of doing a direct mail program? Specifically, she asks about Virginia itself. Is there a, a ballpark figure you can give them today? Um, well, you know, literally, we could talk for the rest of the of the hour on this. We could talk all day, and probably the rest of the. Of the our mics uh, only have so much time. So. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, by studying commercial direct mail, as I said, I did it back in the '60s, uh, and to this day. At my age of 81, I still spend two to three hours, six days a week, studying marketing. 
Uh, I don't have very many competitors that, that do that out mm -hmm. there. So uh, study, study uh, in marketing. Uh, but one of the things I learned, Kyle, early on is the value of the, uh, the importance of the lifetime value of a customer or donor. See, when I'm reading the, uh, the business books, they talk about lifetime value of the customer. Well, it's easy to transcribe that. Okay, I don't need customers, I need donors. Okay, so what's the lifetime value? So early on, I went out there and uh, uh, was able to convince uh, clients, uh, people in the, uh, running conservative organizations, that it's okay to spend a dollar and bring in 80 cents, 90 cents, because the lifetime value of that donor is going to be far, far greater than, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at 10 or 20 cents you might, you might have lost there. So uh, right now, I used to be able to literally, when I started with Young Americans Freedom, we could mail a, a letter for less than 10 cents. <laughs> it's incredible. Postage was literally 1.3 quarters cents. Uh, so anyway, uh, right now you're fortunate to be able to mail a, uh, a prospect letter for less than 50 cents. A house file letter, you know, depends uh, on uh, if you're writing to a high dollar donor or a low dollar donor, can run you 70, 75 uh, cents. But focus on the lifetime value as, of those donors as you're trying to build your mailing mm -hmm. list. And by the way, uh, in 1960, direct mail was the second largest form of advertising in the country. Today, in 2015, direct mail is the second largest form of advertising. So hmm. uh, one of those things that I was telling you about, I caught a lot of criticism in the 70s from the national media uh, because I was doing just that. Mm -hmm. I was uh, you know, spending a million dollars and maybe 700, 800 thousand dollars would come back. And uh, the media would write, Vigory lost $200,000, $300,000. But election night, they saw what we were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, give you one quick example. Uh, we had a client and in the right to National Right to Work Committee. And, yeah. uh, Morton Blackwell is on the board of directors of, of the committee. So uh, the uh, founder and longtime president of uh, the organization, Reed Larson, uh, asked me to put together a campaign to defeat an important piece of legislation that the unions wanted called Common Situs. Mm -hmm. So you got a big, uh, you can say, construction project. When one union goes on strike, all the unions shut down. And the, they wanted that piece of legislation. We wanted to stop it. Uh, Jerry Ford's president of the United States. So Reed authorizes us to mail four million letters. In those days, they each cost 25 cents. So we mailed four million letters. And uh, a friend of mine worked in Jerry Ford's uh, office. And in January of uh, uh, 2076, Ford breaks his word to the unions and he vetoes the legislation because the Congress had passed it. Because my friend of mine in his uh, Ford's press office said he got 720,000 letters and cards on his desk. 720,000 from those 4 million, million wow. letters. Now, the campaign lost about $300,000. We spent a million dollars, $700,000 came back. We lost 300,000, but they got Beside the number one purpose of the mailings, by the way, was not to raise money, mm -hmm. was to defeat the legislation. Right. One, we accomplished that. We educated millions of people about uh, the union's mm -hmm. abuse of power, et, and, uh, et cetera. And we got 90,000 new donors. Wow. I, Reed Larson, everybody else will go to their mm -hmm. grave, never knowing how much money was raised from those 90,000 right. new, but it's something north of 20, 30 million dollars. So the lifetime value of a customer is right. so important when you engage uh, in a campaign mm -hmm. here. Now, 90, uh, acquiring 90,000 new donors is a lot of new donors. Uh, it seems like something of that would help you get through tough time. You know, having more donors helps you get through more tougher uh, tougher times. You know, all of us experience economic downturns at some part sometimes. So does that ever, does having a good prospecting base help you get through those as well? Well, uh, having a good house file. Uh, does right. Because, and I'm glad you, you brought that up, Kaz. I want to mention, I've been doing this now with between time, my 50 years I've had American Target Advertising and the three years I was at Young Americans for Freedom. So that's 53 years. And in that period of time, the next 12 months, the next 12 months between now and, and fall of 2016 is the best time in my lifetime, a very long time, to grow conservative organizations. Hmm. I tell uh, con leaders of conservative organizations that if you don't double 
the size of your organization in the next 12 months, uh, you need to resign and let somebody else run the organization. Because American people uh, who support our type of causes are frightened, they're angry, and as uh, Morton Blackwell says, he started saying this in the spring of 2009, I've said it a hundred times, a thousand times since then. What people want is they want to hear the sound of the cannons and smell the gunpowder. <laughs> so they want action, you know. And so if you're training up the next generation of leaders, maybe 20, 25 years from now, you know, that's good uh, and important. But donors want action right now. So you've got to translate that into how it's going to affect the events in the next 15 teen months there. So the, the message is the next 12, 15 months is the best time in the last 53 years to grow conservative organizations. So, and then it's going to be, hopefully, hopefully it'll be very difficult to raise money from new donors in mm -hmm. 2017, 18, et cetera, because people will feel, wow, the cavalry has arrived. I can put right. down my pick and <laughs> shovel and hammer and saw. I don't have to build the fort anymore. Right. Uh, but if you've got that donor base, okay, and you've bonded with them, mm -hmm. then you will keep a high percent of those people going forward. Naturally. Uh, Susan has a second question uh, that I want to get to today, which is, what are the key components of effective fundraising letter? Um, uh, I know today we're trying to keep everything at sort of a, uh, a larger view, but uh, what are some ways that they can look into, uh, you mentioned study, 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 learn as much as you possibly can. So what are some ways that they can learn to uh, build an effective fundraising letter? Uh, there's many, many, you know, weeds you can get into, right. so to speak. One of the most important things uh, these days is uh, the importance of storytelling. Almost all great teachers in the history of the world uh, are storytellers. Uh, and uh, that's how the number one way you, you, you te teach and communicate. Uh, so, you know, being, bring a story into it. But, and part of that story then is a good time maybe for me to talk about what I call Vigory's Four Horsemen. These are four things that before you ever write the first word of a fundraising letter, you've got to focus on these four things. You've got to get them right. If you get these four things right, life is downhill with the wind to your back. Get any of them wrong, you're going uphill, the wind in your face, you're not likely to succeed. Uh, and I'll explain each one, but the, the four words are position, differentiation, benefit, and brand. Uh, position is nothing more than a hole, H-O-L-E, in the marketplace. Uh, and you decide that privately, what's your hole in the marketplace, what do you want to, you know, what do you want to do that no one else is doing, and how do you differentiate from, from others? Um, and then uh, differentiate is what you do publicly. Let's say that uh, uh, you and I here uh, in our dreams are Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes 20 years ago, and we want to start a TV network. Well, Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch don't sit there and say, well, let's say CBS does this, we'll do this, ABC does it, CNN. They don't care what they do uh -huh. because what they decided to do was occupy a hole in the marketplace, right of center. Nobody serving the 50% of the country doesn't have a TV channel to watch the news uh -huh. on where they can get the objective uh, news. So life got pretty simple at that point. They decided that privately. That's their position. Differentiation. So Publicly, they differentiated from ABC, NBC by hiring Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck for a while, Megyn Kelly, et cetera, okay? And then the third is benefit. Obviously, you get news and information on Fox you don't get anywhere else on television, okay? And the fourth is brand. And brand is the ball game. That is, that's everything. It's one, it's a combination of those other three, position, differentiation, benefit. And it's what makes you singular, what makes you unique. Uh, a famous uh, marketer, uh, communicator, Seth Godin, uh, has written 14, 15 books. Uh, he has a, a daily blog, I strongly rec free, I strongly recommend it to everybody, Seth Godin, G-O-D-I-N. One of his books he wrote was The Purple Cow. I live out in the country, regularly past fields of 40 brown and white cows here, 50 black ones there. They all look alike, can't tell one from the other. But if one of those was a purple cow, and that's the <laughs> title of his book, The Purple Cow, that would make all the difference in the world. So does your organization kind of blend in with a lot of others? So first, before you write that letter, how do you, what, what hole in the marketplace are you talking about? Let's say there's dozens, quite frankly, of good pro-life organizations out there. And for the most part, it's hard to tell one from the other. One of our clients, Students for America, run by Kristen Hawkins, uh, uh, and they do a phenomenal job. By their name, 
they've established a hold in the marketplace. Students for life. Everybody can understand the value of young people talking to other young people about life. Okay, so you know, make sure you understand what is your organization's. Uh, if you're working for a candidate, for example, how does your candidate different? differentiate from all those other candidates out there. And if you say, well, he's smarter, more compassionate, whatever, no, that's not so. The, the voters give you, all of you are smart. You wouldn't be running out there, no. So I use the example sometime of uh, uh, the 2008 Democrat uh, uh, election pr uh, process. Uh, five candidates running for president. Most people can only remember two, Obama and Hillary. The other three, uh, Bill Ridgen, former governor of New, Mexi uh, New Mexico, uh, Chris Dodd, senator from Connecticut, and Joe Biden. The people mm -hmm. forget he ran for president. They'd, they, in the primaries, they got one, one and a half, two percent maybe on a good day uh, because there was no differentiation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Obama had a hole in the marketplace. Hillary had a hole in the marketplace. There was nothing that differentiated. They thought, well, you know, Biden, I'm smarter than those other people. Not so. The people, the public gives you that. Yeah. So what's your, uh, what separates you from all that competition? What do you do that no one else does out there? And you have to talk about that. Make, make that the dominant theme of your package. That you are doing something that's very important and two, no one else is doing it. it seems like that's a good lesson for 2016 as well. Um, we have a couple of other questions here. Uh, Alex um, wants to know, how do you get a job in direct mail? How do you get your, uh, get started and um, work, uh, work on the things that you work on? Well, uh, you know, as I said, we're hiring at ATA, but, uh, and we've hired more than our share of interns and, and, and young people. Uh, quite frankly, with uh, the barbarians used to be at the gate, they're in the Citadel now, they're inside, so we're looking for some people with real experience. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, just you, you go to uh, the many conservative organizations out there, and maybe you volunteer a little bit, may, or get an entry-level job. I had an entry-level job when, when I started, and there's nothing wrong with starting with entry-level level job, and if you study, and you know, as, as I said, within four or five years, you can be in a rare four or five percent of uh, uh, people involved in nonprofit uh, direct marketing, because uh, most people are not spending two or three hours a day studying marketing, and uh, so, uh, uh, you know, Follow your passion. What is your passion? Is it economic issues? Is it health and welfare? Is it uh, you know uh, social issues, cultural issues, whatever it might be, uh, and uh, and start uh, working and volunteering or, or asking for a paid job at any level. And just what you want to do is get your foot in the door, get your nose under the tent, and you can take it from there if you've got talent. Let me just say one other thing here too, uh, that uh, the. Uh, Conservatives need a lot of things, uh, and on a short list of things that we need is new leaders. Uh, maybe that means the number one thing that we need. And I think <laughs> people are looking for leadership. That's one reason why uh, Donald Trump is so popular. People are angry with the leaders that we had, looking for new leaders. But I'm a big advocate of something I call third force. Uh, not third party, third force. Uh, the left has done been so effective over the years with thousands, tens of thousands of third force organizations. Think about environmental groups, all the race-based organizations out there, uh, all the unions out there, etc. And each of these organizations, by the thousands, have their own source of membership, their own source of funds, their own agenda. And they operate totally independent of the Democratic National Committee mm -hmm. or any state committees. And the right has just a handful compared to, to the left. Uh, if Obama called a meeting of all the liberal environmental groups, uh, there'd be 300, 350 show up, okay? If, say, Jim DeMitt of the Heritage Foundation did that, there'd be four, five, six, you know, conservative organizations represented. So we need lots of new third force organizations. And when you do that, you, uh, the organization needs a president, needs a chairman, you need uh, somebody in charge of uh, fundraising, somebody in charge of the press, uh, volunteers, uh, membership, whatever it might be. And uh, so lots of opportunities for, for leadership. And by the way, most people are normal out there. They're not political junkies. You know, they're not going to show up on a Tuesday night for some uh, Republican uh, project or even a mm -hmm. conservative project. But they, they really are interested maybe in the local schools or the uh, over-regulation of small business maybe or uh, over-regulation of property owners, whatever it might be. So you can get people interested in a third force many times more than you can uh, 
say, with political committees. In 1964, Hillary Rodham is a Goldwater girl. She's a conservative in 1964. By 1969, she's a hardcore leftist, okay? Not because of anything the Democratic National Committee did, but because of a single issue. She got involved in a single issue, opposition to the Vietnam War, okay? And then from that, it was an easy step to get involved in many other Democrat uh, projects and causes out there. So get people involved on one issue that they're passionate about. And so the, uh, the, the listener there, uh, Alex, I think it was his name. And he, so what is his passion? Get involved in that, and then you, mm -hmm. uh, you're much more likely to have, much more likely to have success. Bring, uh, bringing that into our conversation today about direct mail, can you build a third force organization, single issue organization from using direct mail, and how should they go about using direct mail fundraising in those or types of organizations? Uh, the, uh, the first thing that I would do, if, if you want to start a new organization, I'm just, uh, quite frankly, uh, a, a nut about this, uh, and I don't do anything in life that I don't first write a four-part plan. I don't do anything that's important, okay? If I'm gonna write a book, uh, I will do a four-part plan. Uh, and then after I've written the book, I do another four-part plan on marketing the, the book. Uh, during the, uh, uh, the late 1970s, early part of the 1980s, well, for about nine years, we used to meet every Wednesday uh, at my home, uh, Morton Blackwell and uh, uh, Paul Wyrick, Ed Fulner, the Heritage Foundation, eight, nine of us, uh, Ron Godwin of the Moral Majority, and we'd plot and plan, and then there was a period of time we'd reconvene at our home for dinner in the evening with the same people for breakfast, but this time congressional backbenchers, the young congressmen, Newt Gingrich, Ben Weber, Bob Walker, Hal Dobbs, others, and uh, we'd plot and plan. Whenever we'd come up with a problem, uh, invariably, uh, Newt Gingrich would go to the blackboard. We didn't have whiteboards in those days. And he'd write four words on there. Vision, goal, strategy, and tactics. An hour later, we had figured out, you know, uh, uh, written in, what's our vision, what's our goal, what's our strategy, what's our tactics, you know. And we saw a clear path forward. And I'm just uh, so, uh, I stress so much the importance of a written plan. And most great leaders will tell you the, the importance of that. You know, Churchill, Eisenhower, others. Uh, and the number one benefit, by the way, of a plan is not working the plan. That's important, but that's secondary. The number one benefit of writing the plan is writing the plan. Because as you write the plan, you thought you wanted to go over here, but you say, no, I need to go over here, I see, and I need more of this, less of that. And so it clarifies your thinking. It helps mm -hmm. crystallize your Orga thinking. There. Organizing your thinking before exactly. you get started. Exactly. It helps organize your thinking. So uh, if you want a career change, do a four-part plan. What's my vision, goal, strategy, and, and then tactics? And the same for a fundraising letter. You know, I, I do the same there. I just don't do much of anything of any importance without that four-part plan. And by the way, it's important uh, to, uh, to share it with others. And it's permissible to change it. Uh, Bill Clinton, when he's 16 years old, is telling people he's going to be president of the United States. When he's in college, his girlfriend, Hillary Rodham, is introducing him. So this is Bill Clinton, my boyfriend. He's going to be president of the United States. And so when you share with people, it puts more pressure on you to, mm -hmm. fill, let's say you've got a uh, goal, I want to lose 50 pounds in the next uh, uh, six months. So you're at dinner, and all of a sudden you order pie a la mode. Your <laughs> friends say, hey, Richard, I thought, you know. <laughs> if so people will hold you accountable. You'll hold yourself okay. accountable. OK. Fair enough. Um, during, during your lectures here at the Leadership Institute, you like to talk about the value of a lifetime donor. How, what, what, are the, what is the value in the sense of direct mail marketing to that lifetime donor? Do they continue, do you see the same people coming back and back to you again over and over again? And how do you, and how do you build a lifetime connection with a donor? Oh gosh, that's, that's a, such an important question, Kyle. We could go so many different directions. Uh, the, uh, that is so important for all organizations that are mature, been in operation for a while to, to know the lifetime value. Otherwise, you don't know how much money to invest in, in finding new donors. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of problems uh, in marketing, direct marketing, direct mail these days. Maybe, maybe number one is what we call churn. Uh, this is an industry-wide average, and it works uh, on the liberal side, the conservative side, health and welfare. 60% on average of the people who give you a uh, contribution the first time never give you a second contribution. So on average, 40% are staying for that second or third contribution. So 
bonding with these people, having a story to tell them, having a hole in the marketplace, you know, it, all these things, they're having a brand. Uh, you know, when you go into the supermarket, uh, there's no one there selling you. There's no one saying, uh, no, uh, Mr. Vigri, uh, don't buy this paper towel, buy this other one over here. I'm a, I'm a Viva person. I like to be, I'm sure Bounty makes a good paper towel, but, but I've already sold before. And no one, they'll check me out, they'll take my money, but no one is, is selling me, okay? So you need to have a hole in the marketplace. You need to be branded uh, with people to take that uh, number from 40% to 60, 70, 80, or higher. And by the way, uh, the, uh, uh, every organization obviously is different, but an organization like a college has been here 100, 200 years or more, uh, they have a lifetime value uh, that's gonna be different than an organization that's relatively new, has just maybe one well-known person running the organization and they're here today, but who knows that they'll be here tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, uh, the lifetime value, you know, is, is important to be to do, and then you you need to make sure you communicate to people that there is uh, structure here. There is uh, uh, life is going to continue after the founder moves on. Here, mm -hmm. uh, Heritage Foundation is a great example. Uh, Ed Fulner didn't build, you know, the Ed Fulner Empire there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was Heritage out there, and so when Her when Ed Fulner retired and Jim uh, Dement came in. I'm sure it was like a seamless operation there, and people know the, it's the institution that's important, not the individual. Too many times, uh, most nonprofit organizations, uh, or particularly conservative ones, are the length and shadow of one person, and people know that. And people know that when that person moves on, the organization probably won't uh, continue at this level of success. Mm -hmm. How important is it to thank your donors after when you have success? After you have said to them, "I want to build. I want to do this. Yeah. Give help me raise fundraising for that." How important is it to write back to them and say, "This is what your contributions well, were today"? Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's um, you know it's vitally important, and it's uh, probably uh, uh, that law of. of direct mail fundraising is probably violated that thanking you more than anything else uh, I uh, uh, encourage clients and we try to do it for our clients uh, send a thank you out within 48 hours 72 hours but send not a generic thank you okay uh, you wrote and told them we've got this problem we want a hundred dollars to solve this problem address that problem you mm -hmm. know I use sometimes example uh, long time ago, but I used to be in college, and uh, sometimes I'd need, you know, five dollars, in those days five dollars was a lot <laughs> back in the 50s, my parents, you know, and then, so they'd send five dollars, ten dollars, whatever, and if I didn't write back and, uh, and thank them for that five, it'd be a little strange, right, okay, uh, and uh, so I had a, a need, and I explained, you know, the need, and then I told them I got the car fixed for this or that mm -hmm. type of thing, so uh, too many times people uh, deal with, with their donors in a way that uh, they can tell that this is a transaction instead of a relationship mm -hmm. that we have here. Uh, and so make all of your activities with your donors more of a relationship than a, just a transaction there. And thank them and thank them for that uh, uh, project and, and then write to them again about that project. They, they're interested in that project. Maybe they're not interested in, in the five other things you, uh, or you do, but that one thing, that's what they really uh, are interested in. Mm -hmm. So we continue to communicate with them. And, and treat them as an individual. I tell people, uh, uh, I was having this conversation uh, yesterday and this morning actually with uh, some of my executives. And uh, too many times people write a letter that's gonna go to a thousand people or 10,000 people, write to one person, <laughs> you know. And over the years, I've maybe, I've employed hundreds if not thousands of people over the years, uh, but I've had maybe eight, 10 uh, of my top copywriters actually understand the concept of writing to one, one person. person and f most of the time it was sad news for me because they would come in boss after five or ten years I got it I really understand what <laughs> you mean by writing to uh, one person and by the way here's my resignation I'm starting my <laughs> own company <laughs> okay. and it is uh, not a lot of people uh, get that concept mm -hmm. but if you ever do you know it's all the difference in the world Arthur Godfrey was a famous radio broadcaster back in the 40s the 50s the 60s and he had a massive radio audience much like uh, Rush Limbaugh does today 
and uh, he was asking, you know, how can you be so successful? And he talked about, I'm not talking to 10, 20 million, right? I'm talking to one person. He's got one person in mind out there, and he's talking to that one person. So the 20 million people say, wow, he's talking to me. And that one-on-one -on -one communication is everything. That's, yeah, you read my mind because that was going to be my next question for you. How is it important to do plural versus singular yeah. communications? Um, we, have t we have time for a couple more questions today, so let's, let's get right into, the, right into them. Um, Bonnie wants to know, uh, you talked about mentoring, and she wants to make sure that you're mentoring people about, about all of this. So she, are you mentoring people Oh, yes. I mean, well, yeah. you know, the, uh, I've, uh, I've heard this any number of times, that the number one job of a president of a company. Now, I'm not president, I'm chairman now. I've got a wonderful uh, uh, woman uh, who's my president and CEO, Kathleen Patton. Uh, but her number one job, my number one job, is to teach. And, and all day long, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm teaching, I'm teaching. Uh, I was having breakfast with some uh, political people this morning, and uh, uh, I was telling them, uh, asking them the question, do you remember Christ's last words on earth? And uh, the, the answer is, go forth and teach all nations. So I teach all the time, and I'm just, uh, whether it's uh, my uh, employees, whether, and my, I'm always available uh, regularly. Uh, people who are not clients will come out and want to pick my brain and brainstorm. I'm always available for, to grow the conservative movement. I mean, it's been, you know, a good part of the last 50 years doing that. And so all of us, you know, I was, I was very fortunate. I had giants who mentored me, literally these were political giants out there. Uh, and uh, I feel, feel very, very blessed that I had these giants. And you know, none of us, uh, Kyle, are a turtle on a stump. You're walking out in the, in the woods and you see a stump, a tree stump, and a turtle on it, you know somebody came by there and put that turtle there. <laughs> he didn't climb up on that turtle. So we're all turtles on a stump. I certainly am one. I've been very blessed to have great uh, teachers along the way. And I still continue to, to mentor uh, my own uh, team as well as other conservative leaders out there and, and young people getting started. And Leadership Institute graduates and, as and, well. Yep, and I never turned down an invitation for the Leadership <laughs> Institute to come and talk about marketing. Great. Um, I think our final question from our audience today is going to come from Donna. Um, how, how, um, how often do you contact your lists? And then a follow-up question to that is, do you seg segment your list? Do you say, OK, we want to talk to the people that respond to us at this frequency more often than the people we, that don't respond to us at a less frequency? Oh, a absolutely. Uh, you know, that's uh, uh, how, how many times you should write. Depends on every organization is, is different. Mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, I don't know, you're uh, uh, Harvard University, you don't write every two or three weeks, you know, uh, saying you're going out of business and you, you need a contribution by sundown. Uh, but uh, in a campaign, uh, in, if you're running a campaign, uh, maybe you might write every three or four weeks uh, in January. But by sep August, September, and October, mm -hmm. you can be writing every 10 days. People know the, the, the election's uh, looming on us here. So, uh, it, you know, but when you write, have a reason to write. Mm -hmm. Don't just say that, hey, I understand you've got money. I need money. <laughs> Send it and be quick about it. Uh, that uh, and that's the way, quite frankly, most mm -hmm. fundraising letters uh, right. come across there. Right. So uh, I've you, I know always notice an influx of emails or marketing uh, uh, for candidates around uh, fundraising deadlines when they have the quarterly reports come out. I notice that you know I get yeah. five emails a day from right. different people on different campaign on the same campaign saying give right. us money before this important deadline. Yeah. I made a comment earlier about we're just trying to figure out the internet. Uh, some things we do know, such as uh, the vast majority of online contributions uh, are given in the month of December. And the vast majority of that uh, December's month comes in the last 72 hours. Hmm. Uh, you know, and that's for a C3. C4 is different. But where it's tax deductible, people can make uh, tax deductible, reduce this year's taxes, et cetera. There. <laughs> so the uh, huge amount of money is raised on the internet in the last 72 hours there. Very interesting. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to tell us about your favorite, about some of your success stories, and continue on in the final moments here. So, uh, what do you, what, what well, should we leave here with? All right. Let, let me just say, you know, the uh, 
in advertising, uh, there's probably one uh, secret that's more important than any other quote unquote secret, uh, and, and that is repetition. Coca-Cola knows that, <laughs> uh, so that uh, you know, a board member of Coca-Cola ever went to a board meeting and said, it took me 30 minutes to drive here, I passed six uh, billboards for Coca-Cola, what a waste, I just needed one, not so. <laughs> Everybody knows the more you tell, the more you sell. And uh, so uh, I'm going to briefly repeat, uh, Kyle, some of the things that I covered here, because uh, you know, some of these issues are so important. There are lots of uh, uh, places you can go to find out uh, the size of the envelope, uh, you know, how long should a letter be and, you know, who should sign it and what's on the letterhead and one thing or another about a PS and all that. But the big picture things are my four horsemen, position, differentiation, benefit, and brand. And unless your organization, you know, is unique and stands apart as a purple cow, it's going to be very, very difficult to, uh, to be successful. You need, need a, a written plan. Uh, you need to study, 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 read, read, read. Again, and to repeat myself, at my age, I spend two to three hours every day, six days a week, studying marketing. And it's just so important to, uh, to do that. Uh, get a mentor, uh, you know, have somebody to, uh, to adopt you, you know, or go and work for somebody who's, uh, you know, a giant out there. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people out there in, in commercial world as, as in the, the nonprofit world who, uh, uh, who you know, could, uh, we would love to help uh, uh, teach you. I, uh, I had a giant of a teacher, a man named Ed Mayer, who uh, used to do nothing but teach uh, drink mail all day long for years and years and years. When he died, uh, a man named Dick Benson, who was also a giant, he called me on the phone and said, your, uh, your guru just died. Can I be your new guru? I said, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, just very, very blessed uh, to have. I talked about the importance of third force. Uh, that we need thousands and thousands of new organizations out there. Uh, we need new leadership. Our country is just desperate for, for leaders, especially new young leaders out there. And, and you become a leader by doing, okay? When and I uh, start you know, in New York, and then I'm, after a year or two, we moved to Washington, D.C., uh, I had a lot of good ideas, I thought, and I wanted to uh, express myself in this area and that area. Nobody asked my opinion. So I would start calling meetings, and that you know people would come, and uh, and then I you know they would invite me to their meetings. So take the initiative, put energy out there. Uh, and I read something that Nancy Pelosi uh, said years ago as she's climbing the leadership ladder in the Democratic Party. She had discovered something that I had discovered 50 years ago, and it is this: uh, you'd be surprised how many important people will come to your meetings if you serve good food. <laughs> and that's very, very true. So over the years, I've, I've had literally thousands and thousands of meetings at my home and my mm -hmm. office, and we serve good, good food, food, and I'm never short of, of important people to come <laughs> to the meetings. Very good, very good. Well, uh, I think we should rename today's uh, webinar, Be a Purple Cow. I think that's a much better <laughs> title today. Um, thank you for joining us today, Richard, and, and giving us your, your wisdom of direct mail fundraising and, and everything else that you had to say today. My, my pleasure. Let, let me just say, close one, one quick point. This is the best time in, 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 uh, in the last 50 years to grow conservative organization in the next 12 months. So if you don't double your size of your organization in the next 12 months, you're doing something wrong. It's a great opportunity to take advantage. Of. Take advantage. Well, thank you again, and thank you all for joining us today. This was a wonderful webinar where we got to talk about, talk about a lot of great things with Richard today. It will be online. It was recorded, as always. Um, it will be put up at www.leadershipinstitute.org slash activism on demand for your viewing. Uh, you can send it to your friends, watch it again yourself if you miss some key points, but it will be there for you to, to view. Um, if you're interested in continuing to talk about and to learn about uh, fundraising, we have a school coming up, uh, the Comprehensive uh, Fundraising School, where we talk about high dollar fundraising, direct mail marketing, and online uh, fundraising. That will be from September 29th to October 2nd, and you can find the details and register for that training online at leadershipinstitute.org slash training. Um, with that, our next webinar will be on October August 26th with on the topic of being proactive in media and the pe folks from Learn Liberty will be here to joining us in the studio to talk about to talk about that um, so uh, it should be a good one thank you all again for joining us and thank you again for your questions have a good night <laughs>